Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for what you have done for us in Christ. As we've been talking over the last several weeks, God, we are saved by grace, which means, God, we don't deserve it. You, in your great kindness and love, God, have done good to us. That is what grace is. You have made us alive. And God, I pray maybe for those today who haven't experienced that moment, that that would happen, that you would overcome their resistance to you. I think for those of us, God, that it has, I pray as we talk today, we would remember that. We would remember, bring to mind the fact that you have been so gracious to us. And God, as we open up your word now, I pray that you would fill us with your spirit, help us to see and to know, and then ultimately to live in light of these truths. And as always, God, help me to communicate it in a way that is honoring to you and then helpful to us. We thank you for it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you have a Bible with you today, we are in Ephesians chapter two. We've been hanging out there for a couple weeks. If you don't have a Bible, don't worry. The verses will be here on the screen. If you don't even own one, we would love to give you one as a gift today, both locations. If you don't have a Bible, just ask for one after the gathering is over. Someone in a blue shirt will be able to hand you one. But we're just walking through the book of Ephesians or the letter to the church that is in Ephesus, and it is a letter, as I've said this many times, and it's meant to be written, uh, written, read, redden, is it? Can we say reddened? I don't understand. We should, all right? It's meant to be read from beginning to end. And so if you haven't read the letter, I would encourage you to read it. And there's primarily two sections, sections one through three, and then sections four through six. And so we're in this first section, Lord willing, we'll finish it out on Christmas this year, which is hard to believe we're getting close to Christmas. I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm surprised every year, which I shouldn't be, right? Because it's like, it happens every year. Um, Just like Hope for Christmas. So I hope you're not surprised by that. Please take that card and sponsor some children's and uh, some children's, some kids (laughs) in Jasper and in Canton, Pickens County and Cherokee County, because it is a great opportunity to live life on Mission, But we're talking through the uh, book of Ephesians or the letter of Ephesus, uh, the letter to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter two. And this week and next week, we will finish out chapter two. And and Paul is going to start to get into the implications of what we've talked about over the last several weeks by the fact that we are saved by grace through faith. And so if you weren't here, you can go back and listen to those messages. So today we're primarily going to be in verses 11 through 16, and we're going to talk about what we've been talking about because the very first word of verse 11 starts with the word, therefore. And I've taught you this, and hopefully you remember, but anytime you see the word therefore, you should ask yourself the question, what is it? What is it there for? All right, so let's look at it. We're going to see why it's there. Verse 11 and 12 says, therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Verse 12, remember that you were at one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So he says, therefore, remember. In fact, that's the title of this week's message. And it's a command, by the way. He is commanding them to remember something. Now, the first thing we need to understand when he says this here in remember is he's saying it to a particular group of people. And this particular group of people he is saying it to is the Gentiles, which we got into this last week. If you were here, they were called not just Gentiles, but those that were uncircumcised. And again, I know that's a weird conversation to be having in church, but shortly, it's just the Old Testament sign of a covenant relationship with God, as I belabored that point last week. 
And so if you're reading your Bible and you keep wondering, why in the world does the Bible keep talking about this? In the New Testament equivalent, it's just like talking about baptism, which again, I've made the point, baptism makes church membership way easier than circumcision, all right? Which is why we celebrate it every week. And baptism is simply a public profession of a personal relationship with God. So in this church, you have to remember, this is now post-Jesus, you know, post-resurrection of Jesus. And it started in Jerusalem, primarily with the Jewish people. And then it moved out, as Jesus said that it should, in Matthew 28, from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So naturally, it was going to move out beyond the Jewish people to what the Bible just calls the Gentile people, which that is just another way of saying non-Jewish, which was God's plan all along. So the church primarily in the New Testament in the first century was made up of a majority of Jewish people. And then as it moves out, it starts to move out to places further away from Jerusalem. And then it starts to be made up of a majority of Gentile people or non-Jewish people. And they have different customs. They have different backgrounds. And so one of the biggest issues in this first century church of Ephesus, which you have to remember, was in modern day Turkey. So it was on the west coast of Turkey, right there on the sea. And so it was a very, very like um, influential city. In fact, you can go there today. There's still a bunch of Greek buildings to Greek gods and all this kind of stuff. And so it was more Gentile than Jewish. It was more Gentile than Jewish. And so you had these two groups of people trying to interact with one another, coming from different backgrounds, trying to live together as the new people of God in the church. And I know this never happens in churches today. So this is kind of a foreign concept to us, but these two groups couldn't get along. I know that never happens, all right? The Bible is so irrelevant to our lives. And so these two groups are coming together And in essence, you have one group saying to the other group, you're not like us. So therefore, since you're not like us, you're less than. And Paul's going to start to address this reality. You can think about it like this. You have circumcision, uncircumcision. You have worthy and unworthy. And here's where Paul is going to belabor the point. We have to remember that no matter what your social standing was before Jesus, no matter what your ethnicity was before Jesus, there was not good and bad. There was dead and alive. So all of us were in the unworthy category. All of us were in the unworthy category, and that's what we need to remember. We need to remember that. And this phrase, remember, anytime you see a word with the prefix R-E, remember or remind, that prefix is there because it literally means again and again, all right? And the word member means to bring to mind. It comes from the Latin word for memory. So it means bring to your memory again and again and again. Bring to your memory again and again and again what? That we were once far off. We need to reflect on this because it's reflecting on this that actually leads to transformation. In fact, let me give you this quote. I have it here on the screen, and this is the idea I want us to wrap our minds around or remember. We don't learn from experience We learn by reflecting on experience. That comes from John Dewey. He was a famous psychologist in the last century, very influential in our education system. Even though he wasn't a Christian, he understood how the mind worked. And here's what he's trying to say. We don't just learn by experience in and of itself. 
We learn by reflecting on it. And what I love about this word reflecting, same idea, it has the prefix re, which means again and again. The word flect, because if you think about reflect, what am I supposed to do again and again? The word flect means to bend back. Bend back. All I can think about it now is like in terms of flexibility. Think about that, right? Like reflex. So a reflex is, is you're responding, right? Like something happens and then you respond and they're checking your, you know, your reflex response. Well, to reflect means to bend back again. And here's what John Dewey is saying. Real transformation comes when we bend back our minds to the experience that we had. We think about it. We reflect on it. We remember it. And this is so important personally for me to understand because I don't know about you, but I'm the type of person that loves experiences. Love it. I'm here for the party, y'all. I'm here for a good time. In fact, I am so, I wouldn't say so unorganized, like, in, like, I'm, a, like I'm a mess. I'm not saying that. But I so don't care about details. I so don't care about planning things out because I just want to figure it out as we go. This is why I'm a horrible painter, by the way. I just like to get some paint on the walls, baby. I just like to get it started. Let's just get it going. We'll figure it out as we go. And so what can happen is I, I mean, I am here for an experience. In fact, to me, the greatest day ever is when we just wake up, get in the car and let's go. Let's just figure it out. Where are we going? I don't know. We'll see when we get there. I'm really good in the moment, really good in the moment. But here's the problem. I go from one moment to the next moment and I don't ever stop and think about the last moment. I don't ever stop and look back and reflect. In fact, that's one of the reasons why I needed to personally to take a sabbatical this last summer is because I just needed time to reflect, to bend my mind back to experiences that I've had. I'll, I'll never forget when my mom passed away. In fact, next month, it will be 10 years ago. Literally, I went back to Texas, celebrated her funeral. This is my mom. And came back like seven days later and preached. And it was about six months after that that I really started to grieve because I didn't know what grief was because I just went from one experience to the next experience. But here's what life has taught me. That don't work too well. If you just move from one experience to the next experience and you never reflect back on that experience, here's what I've realized. Those emotions will catch up to you. They'll catch up to you. You need to remember. You need to reflect. And the primary thing that Paul is telling this church to reflect on, to remember, is that at one time, they were separated from Christ. And there's five things that he says here in verse 12. I'll just read them again. You are separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God. Five things there, which all are kind of like descriptive phrases of the first one, being separated from Christ. Being separated from Christ. See, the, the Bible calls Christ our high priest. And what that means is, again, thinking about how Jewish the Christian faith is, at the temple, only the high priest could go in once a year and offer sacrifices for the people. And that was there as a setup to help us understand, ultimately, God is holy, a sacrifice must be made, and so the Jewish people would have a high priest every year. Well, Hebrews tells us Christ is our high priest, that that system that was set up was called a type or a foreshadowing to who Jesus was. 
And so if we're separated from Christ, what that means is we have nobody to advocate for us with the Holy God. And Paul is belaboring the point to say, you need to remember that. That at one time, you didn't have a high priest to go before you. You didn't have a high priest to literally go between the curtain, between the unholy and the holy and advocate for you. But now you do. Now you have Christ. So first, you need to remember, you didn't have a high priest, now you do. Here's the second thing he says. And because you were separated from Christ, you were separated from the commonwealth of Israel. Here's the best way to think about that. Not only did you not have a high priest, you weren't a part of the people of God. Not only were you separated from God, but you were separated from God's family, God's people. Now here's what's interesting. He says you were separated from the commonwealth of Israel. If you listen to our church podcast, I think it was two weeks ago, we got another one dropping this week, talking about Israel. The last one was about the difference between national and spiritual Israel. This week will be about Israel and the role of prophecy. And so make sure you listen to that because it's very, you know, all the stuff that are going on is going on in the world today. You need to understand it. But what you need to understand is when we think of the word Israel, we typically think of instantly the nation or the physical people. And I'm not saying that's wrong or bad because there is a physical people. We forget Israel wasn't just a nation, it was a dude, right? His name used to be Jacob. We did a series back in 2020 called Welcome to the Wrestle. You can go listen to that, where Jacob wrestles with God. God changes his name from Jacob to Israel. He had 12 sons. They become the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 kids of Israel. And that, God turns that, that family into a nation made up of families. But here's what we need to know. The whole storyline of the Bible was never to stop with that family, that family becoming a nation of families. Now, watch this. It's a family made up of nations. Not a nation made up of families, but it's a family made up of nations, every tribe and tongue. So not only were we separated from Christ, we were separated from spiritual Israel, the people of God. Which then he says, the third one, that meant we were strangers to the covenants of promise. See, the entire Old Testament is necessary. This is why you cannot disconnect yourself from the Old Testament. Again, we'll talk more about this in the podcast this week why some people do that and why I think that is a failure to understand the entire premise and plan and promise of God. But in the Old Testament, you have all the promises of God. You have all the promises of God that God makes to his people, Israel. And here's what Paul's saying. Now in Christ, all those promises that God made To Israel, it was never about God making those promises to a physical nation. It was always about God making those promises to his family, which is made up of not just one people of one ethnicity, but his people from all ethnicities, what is called spiritual Israel. Look at verse 13. This is what we need to know. He says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. See, there was a time that you were separated from all of that. And since you were separated from all of that, there was two results. You had no hope because you were without God. You had no hope because you were without God. And that phrase there, without God, back in verse 12, literally is the Greek word atheist. It's where we get our word atheist. Because anytime you put the word a before a word, it means the opposite. So if someone is without God, watch this, they are without hope. You say, well, that's a, what a statement. I'm not calling out atheists. I'm just saying, what's your hope? Well, my hope is in mankind. (laughs) Really? See, back in the 20th century, everybody's hope was in education. Everybody's hope was in helping people to know more. Now we know more and we're dumber than ever. See, here's where you fail to understand. Without the promises of God, there's no hope. Why? Because death beats education. Death beats humanity. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how rich you are. I don't care, watch this, what group you're a part of, you still die. And therefore you have no hope. But look at what he says. 
but now. I told you the best two words in the Bible are but God. Next, next best two, but now, in Christ. Watch this. You're not separated anymore. You're a part of the people of God now because you have the promises. You say, where do you get that from? All right, look at 2 Corinthians chapter one. You can just write it down as a reference if you don't want to turn there. I've got it here on the screen. Just in case you think I make this stuff up, all right? Look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter one, verse 20. For all the promises of God find their what? Let me say that again. And by the, let me say that again. I mean, I want you to say that again with me louder, all right? Come on, Jasper. For all the promises of God find their in him. He didn't say find their maybe. Parents, you know how that works. When your kid asks you something, you say maybe. Maybe means what? See? Find their yes in him. Listen to this. That is why through him, who's the him? Christ. We order, we order. Guess I'm hungry. We utter our amen. Our amen to God for his glory. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ by grace through faith and has anointed us and who has put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. See, that is the encouragement that we need to remind ourselves of. Every promise. When Paul says that, you need to know something. When Paul wrote 2 Corinthians, the New Testament didn't exist because Paul's literally writing it. So what promises is he talking about? There was only one set of scriptures at that time. I'm not saying there's two now. I'm just saying now we put it all together into two testaments. But at that point in time, what Paul was talking about was clearly all the promises and what we now call the Old Testament, what they would just have called the scriptures. Here's what Paul said, and we'll get into this when we get into chapter three, because it was a mystery. He says, all those promises, now, are a yes, y'all, are a yes in Christ. Every promise that God made in the Old Testament to his people, now, if you're in Christ, they are a yes to you. They're a yes. Don't you think that's worth remembering? Don't you think that's worth reflecting on? Don't you think that's worth bending your mind back to? Why? Here's why. Because if you don't remember that, if you don't bring that to your mind, you know what you'll bring back to your mind? The groups that you're not a part of. The things that you failed in. How somehow, in some way, you didn't measure up for this thing. See, that's why he's telling this, listen, to the Gentile people. See, here's what happens. And this primarily starts happening in middle school. We start defining ourselves by groups and identities that separate us. Because none of us wanna be the same. We wanna be separate. We wanna be different. We wanna be unique. And so what happens a lot of times is we'll start defining, our, we'll, one or two things. We'll start over-identifying with our own family or we'll start over-identifying with another family that's completely different than our family because we wanna be different. Because we think being different means being special. You know, I'm not like them. I'm like them. And so primarily during this time, it's about identity formation. Watch this. Who is the one that is my savior? my go-between between me and God, what people am I a part of? 
And what promises am I living on? Every single human being does this. So we start to think, okay, I'm, I'm an athlete. I'm athletic. So my savior is gonna be me. My group that I'm a part of is the athletic group. And the promise is if I succeed in this, I'll succeed in life. So watch this. This group being an athlete becomes a self-salvation project which promises you freedom in life, i.e. college, i.e. money. Which is why a lot, I can't tell you how many times I've seen this. When athletes get injured, they didn't just lose their scholarship. They didn't just lose their ability to play. They lost their identity. They don't know who they are anymore. Because if they aren't an athlete, if they can't succeed in this sport, who are they? And then kicks in, they have no hope anymore. Watch this, not because they're without God, but because they're without their God. Which is why we have to be very careful, parents, of sending the unintentional message to our children that sports is the key to college. And if you get college, you get a good life. I can't tell you how, again, I've been a student pastor for a long time. Still feel like I am a lot of times. I'm trying to grow up, y'all. I'm trying. It's tough out here. Can't tell you how many people I have seen walk away from God because their parents sent the unintentional message that this is where the promise is. Not in God, in sports and in college. So we gotta remember something. And listen, don't hear me say something I'm not saying. I'm not saying sports is bad. I started playing when I was five, went all the way up through high school. Had many college scholarship offers, but I had the choice to make. Is my life about that or is my life about God? So I gave that up and went to God. I'm not trying to say that because I'm better. What I'm trying to say is I had to wrestle this identity question in my own life. But let me ask you this. Which one produces more hope that we need to remember? Sports, money, Power, prestige, or God? Let me say it to you like this. If you're in God's family, it doesn't matter what group you're not a part of. I mean, think about it. You're not in the cool kids group, you're, or you are in the kids cool, kids cool group, or whatever. I don't know what all the, there's so many groups today, I can't even begin to know what they are, all right? What do you tell yourself? I mean, I'm a part of God's family. Why does it matter if y'all don't like me? I'm not saying this is a license to be a jerk, okay? But what I am saying is this. Is God your first identity? Is being a part of Christ and the family of God the identity that forms everything else about who you are? Because if you lose these other things, this is what you can tell yourself. I haven't lost my hope. I haven't lost my God. I haven't lost the fact that all the promises of God are a yes. And listen to me, especially teenage girls, God's promises are better than some smelly teenage boys. <laughs> well, he doesn't love me. Bro, he likes the smell of his own farts and that's what you think <laughs> is gonna make you happy? Never thought you'd hear that in a sermon, all right? <laughs> you see what I'm saying here? We have to remember. We have to remember. If we get God, we get everything. So let me, next point. Every amen is a moment to remember. Every amen is a moment to to remember. Notice he said there in 1 Corinthians, he said, this is why we utter our amen. The word in English, amen, we just brought over from, from Greek. You didn't realize, oh, I've said this to you before if you've been around here, 
But in Greek, the word amen is amen. It's the same exact word. We just brought it over. And what it means is this is true or truly, truly. And the reason why we say amen at a at the end of a prayer is we are asking God to let what we just prayed to be true. That's why you say it. The difference between us and Jesus, when Jesus prayed, he put his amens at the beginning. And here's what he said. This is true. Amen, amen. And then he says what is true. See, we're a little different like that. We don't put it at the beginning because we're not God in the flesh. We put it at the end because we're begging God in heaven to listen to, in Jesus' name, this thing that we just prayed, please make it true. But here's what you need to understand. Every amen, and by every amen, I mean every prayer, is an opportunity to remember. Is an opportunity to remember. Listen, think about your prayers. I would venture to say your prayers, a lot like mine, are you praying a lot of times for things that you want? And they may be good things. Like, God, help me get this thing. Help me be a part of this thing. Heal this person. All those things. But here's what we have to understand. If the answer to those things is no, you have to remember that ultimately God's answer to you in Christ is yes. And I've seen a lot of people walk away from God because they got a no to something. And then it just revealed their identity. That their identity wasn't in the fact that God already said yes to them in Christ. They walked away because they thought, well, what God did for me in Christ is not enough. He didn't heal this person. He didn't do this thing. And since he didn't do that thing, he can't be good. Which here's what the Bible's saying. How could he not be good? I understand you wanted him to do that and he didn't, but you're missing what he did do. You're missing what he did for you in Christ. So every prayer, every amen is an opportunity to bend your mind back to the fact that you weren't once were far off, but now you've been brought near. Now there's a specific application to this that Paul is going to make, which we'll get into more next week as well. But you need to understand, if this is true, if it is true that God saves us all by grace, that we were all once far off, but now we've been brought near in Christ, all the promises of God are a yes, then what that means is now there's no distinctions between Jew and Gentile. Now there is no privileged group in the sight of God because all are the same. Look at verse 14. For he himself is our peace, Jesus who has made us both one, us, that means two, both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that that he might create in himself one new man in the place of how many? Two. So that, or so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the, through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. See, remember, this was written to a church that had primarily Jewish people and Gentile people that couldn't get along. Because they were defining themselves by other characteristics. Defining themselves by their ethnicity. Defining themselves by their race defining themselves by their social class, defining themselves by their political affiliations. And here's what Paul's saying. You guys have forgotten something. You've forgotten that you're using the wrong categories. It's not Jew and Gentile. Let's make this more modern day. It's not white and black or this ethnicity and this ethnicity. It's not male and female. It's not slave or free. It's dead and alive. And if you're in the alive category, that's because God made you alive by grace through faith, and you've forgotten that the only category you were a part of before this one wasn't privileged. It wasn't special because you were dead. 
And here's why he's saying this. He's saying this to Gentile believers and Jewish believers. Remember, you both needed Christ. You both were dead in your trespasses and sins. But now in Christ Jesus. Yeah, Gentiles, you were farther away from the covenants of promise. But Jewish people, you were just as far, even though you were close. Because sometimes the furthest people are those that are close. Jewish people, likewise, missed that Jesus was their Messiah. And this is where we wrestle with people like, how could the Jewish people miss it? I don't know. How could you miss it? Because everybody misses it. Because the whole point of the entire Old Testament was to show you that God, yes, did choose a people, the Israel people. He did choose a family because Jesus had to come from a family. So the entire point of the Old Testament was not trying to show you that God only loves this group of people, but he loves all people. But from this group of people will come the person that will save all groups of people. That's Jesus Christ. So since that's true, and it is, how in the world can we come in church and put up dividing walls? So you have to remember something. This letter, most scholars believe, was written in between 60, 62 AD. And in case you don't know, that does, AD does not mean after death, all right? BC does mean before Christ. AD is Latin for Anno Domini. It means the year of the Lord. Now, in secular world today, we don't use those. We say BCE, which is before common era, and CE, which is common era. They still divide everything by Christ. They just don't like to say it was Christ. <laughs> but this letter was written in 60 to 62 AD. The temple, which again, we'll talk about this on the podcast this week. The temple was destroyed by Rome in 70 AD, which Jesus predicted that it would be. He said, no stone will be left on this mount. It would all be thrown down. And what's crazy, you can go on the western, kind of the southwest side of the city, and you can see the stones that Jesus prophesied would be thrown down. And they're thrown down. They're there. But at this time, the temple still stood. And in the temple, if you don't know anything about it, in its construction, it was divided up. I've already said one between the Holy of Holies and what's called the holy place. And that's where the high priest would go in. And we know that when Jesus died, we study this in the Gospel of John, when Jesus died, literally at that moment when he breathed his last, the temple that divided the holy place between the holy of holies was torn. Here's what's cool to me, from top to bottom. How in the world was it torn from top to bottom? It's like God took it like a piece of paper and went like this. Because that was a tall curtain, y'all. Couldn't nobody else get up there and tear that sucker. But God can, because he's higher than a curtain. But that's not the only dividing wall that Jesus tore down. He didn't just tear down the dividing wall between man and God. He also tore down the dividing wall between man and man. Because there was another dividing wall. In fact, there were several dividing walls in the temple. One between priests and men. One between men and women. And then one between Jews and Gentiles. The court of the Gentiles was outside. And then there was a gate called the beautiful gate. It's because it was so big and beautiful where only Jewish people could enter. Here's what I thought. It's even more beautiful now because more than Jewish people can enter. And it's even more beautiful now because we can all enter into the holiest of places because of high, our high priest. So think about it like this. Here's what Paul's saying. I know you can go to the temple, Jewish people, and still see the dividing walls. But in Christ, in his flesh, all that was broken down. See, not just the dividing wall between the holy place and the holy of holies, but the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile as well. He's torn it down. So what does that mean for our churches? 
What it means is you may have resurrected some dividing walls that Jesus tore down. Some dividing walls like ethnicity. Some dividing walls like social status. Some dividing walls like Jew and Gentile. Where in your heart, you may realize that because of Christ, you've now been brought near to God, but you've failed to realize because of Christ, you've now been brought near to your neighbor. We'll get into this more next week when he uses the word stranger and aliens. Yes, I believe aliens exist, but not the little green ones from other planets, all right? There's now no dividing wall between you and your fellow neighbor. If that fellow neighbor is in Christ, they were just like you. They were dead. Now they've been made alive. So what we need to do is quit looking at that other person like they're somehow different than us and like we're somehow better than them. Because <laughs> you're not. The promises of God in Christ apply to them just like they do to you. And what grieves me, which I think grieves the heart of God, is how Christians put other identities ahead of their identity of being part of the family of God. Other identities like their nationality, other identities like their political affiliation. Listen, I'm not saying we can't love our country. I love our country. In fact, this week we celebrated Veterans Day. I'm so grateful for all of our veterans that fought for our country, and we all should. Yeah, we can clap for that. Praise God. Every nation has the right to defend themselves. And I'm so grateful for the men and women who've defended ours. But what I'm getting at is this. The nation is different than the church. God instituted both. And the nation has a right, according to Romans 13, to enact the sword, which is to enact justice. But the church should be made up of people that come out of all nations. Nations that previously hated each other. Nations that previously were enemies of one another. Groups of people historically that hated each other, that were enemies of one another. Because now in Christ, they've been brought near just like I've been brought near. Doesn't matter, watch this, doesn't matter where I started. What matters is where I ended up. And this is what grieves me about the church, where so much of the church, and this isn't a uniquely American thing, by the way. This happens to churches in every nation on the planet. This is, by the way, why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. Jonah couldn't fathom that God would love people like the people of Nineveh. You mean them? You want me to go to them? And Jonah's like, I ain't doing it. And this is what's crazy. You don't get it so much because we don't understand geography a lot. He, bro literally ran the opposite direction of Nineveh. And what did God do? Swallowed him up. We don't know if it was a whale, big fish. And he was in there for three days. Here's what's crazy. Jesus actually picks it up on that and says that Jesus is the greater Jonah. See, Jonah eventually went to Nineveh, didn't he? And then... You know what Jonah did after the people of Nineveh repented? Bro complained about it. He's like, this is why I didn't want to go because I knew you were going to be gracious to them and I didn't want you to be gracious to them. I wanted you to kill them. Go read the book. It's only four chapters. Very easy to read. Jonah literally gripes to God because he knew he was going to be merciful to those people. And you know where modern day Nineveh is? Iran. <laughs> Hold on. You mean God loves Iranians? Yeah. 
And listen, I'm not talking about the leaders of Iran in the sense that God's not upset with them. That is sinful, evil. They are one of the foremost proxies of evil on the planet, and our nation should resist that and fight back against that. But what we have to be careful of in our own heart, in fact, we have some people that came to our church from Iran, is God loves Iranians just as he, much as he loves Americans, just as much as he loves the Jewish people, just as much as he loves Syrians. You see what I'm saying? Let me give you the last point. In one body, everybody can now be a part of the body. I gotta admit, I was pretty proud of that alliteration, all right? <laughs> In one body, everybody, Every body, body, can now be a part of the body. Let me give you translation. Next slide. In one body, Jesus. Everybody, Jew and Gentile. You could, you could put in there whatever you want. American, non-American, black, white, male, female. In one body, everybody can now be a part of the body, which is the church. Do you understand the entire book of Ephesians is about the body, the church? The entire book of Ephesians is about the body. Jesus is the head, the church is the body. And we'll talk more about this next week, how the body is built up. The entire book of, book, the entire book of Colossians is about Jesus as the head. So Ephesians and Colossians go together because Colossians tells you about the head, Ephesians tells you about the body. But the body is now subject to the head. That's how it works. And what's crazy is you got one part of the body over here, this left hand, saying to this part of the body over here, I don't like you. Because how do we divide this up? Especially in our country. This would be my left, your right. Left and right. You mean left and right can be a part of the same hand? Yeah. You mean Jew and Gentile can be a part of the same body? Yeah. This is why Paul builds it out in Corinthians. How can the foot say to the hand, I don't need you? Listen, if you ain't got no feet, you're gonna have a hard time walking hands. <laughs> and maybe, just maybe, our churches look so deformed and messed up because they're trying to walk without the other parts of the body. You got churches that are all hands. They just slap everybody. <laughs> you got churches with no hearts. You got churches with no feet. And I say this all the time. Some of y'all are the appendix. We don't know what you do, but you could kill us all. <laughs> How can one part say to the other part, I don't need you. See, this body is made up now of people from everybody, every tribe, every tongue, every language. Because the world really isn't divided the way we think it is. It's only divided by dead and alive. And everybody in the world started in the same category, which was dead. But now in Christ have been brought near, have been made alive. So the two implications of that, and we're done. The two implications is you need to remember that. Number one, you need to remember that for yourself so that you're not depressed and anxious because you're not where you thought you should be by this point in your life or you lost something that you thought that was most important. Who cares? At the end of the day, you're in Christ. And the second thing you remember is not just for yourself, but it's for the family. There are now people in the family that don't look like you and don't like you. And you are not justified in not liking them because you're in Christ, they're in Christ, and they're your brother and sister. Here's what's crazy. There are going to be people in heaven that you don't like. But you fail to make the assumption that God actually likes you more than them because he lets you in. No. See, we were all dead. Now we're alive. Let's, therefore, 
remember. Let's pray. Father, thank you. We look at what's going on in the world today and all we see is so much hostility. And that's why when we say the answer is not a geopolitical one, it's Jesus. We're not being cheeky. It's because it's only in Jesus can the categories change. The categories are no longer Jew and Gentile, black and white, male and female, Jewish or Arab. The categories now are dead and alive. And all of us were dead. But by grace, you've made us alive. So if that's true, God, we need to remember. And I pray right now, God, for those listening or watching that maybe have never had a moment where they were made alive. Maybe through this sermon today, they're being convicted by the Holy Spirit that they've put something else as their functional savior. Maybe it is sports. Maybe it is success. Maybe it is relationships. But I pray, God, that they would realize all those promises are not gonna hold them. So they can't hope in those. But in Jesus, they can have hope, not only for this life, but the next. No one looking around or talking here as we close. If there's never come a point in time in your life where you have been made alive, where you realize all the promises of God are now a yes to you in Christ where by grace, through faith, you trusted in Jesus. If that never happened, that can happen today. So right there where you are, if God is opening your eyes to see the truth that you're dead, you need to be made alive, then you can pray with me. You don't have to say this out loud because ultimately it's between you and God, but you can confess and repent and be saved. And it goes like this. You can say, Father, thank you for loving me. You sent Jesus in my place for my sin. I was dead, now I'm alive. And in faith, I'm trusting in Jesus alone. Thank you for loving me. Again, nobody looking around or talking, but if you're here today in one of our physical locations and you just pray that with me, we just simply lift your hand up. We got men and women that are here and walk around, put a Bible in your hand. When they do, you can put it down, thank you. Within those of us who have been brought near. We have been saved. Two things to remember. Number one, remember that you were far off. You were separated from God and his people with no promises and no hope. But now in Christ, you've been brought near. Remind yourself of that this week. When things don't go your way this week, when you feel like an outcast at work or you feel like an outcast at school or at that group and you wish you were a part of that group, remind yourself you're a part of God's family. And if you're part of God's family, what do these groups ultimately matter? You're not outside. You've been brought near. And the second thing you need to remember is not only have you been brought near to God in Christ, but you've been brought near to your neighbor. So if you have hostility between a certain group in you or a certain person in you, in Christ, that hostility has been broken down and you need to go near to them just like Christ came near to you. And if you can't go near to them, then you don't understand how Christ came near to you. He came to you while you were still a sinner. You go to them while they're still a sinner and you graciously love them. God, I pray that you would Continue to build our church. God, this is one of the things I am the most grateful for in Revolution Church. We try really hard not to put up these dividing walls. And God, I pray that you will continue to break them down, not only physically, but spiritually. We put up so many walls. God, I pray that we would reflect back. We bend our minds back to the fact that all of us were dead, but you made us alive. And if that's true, and it is, if we are in Christ, God, we are, we are in you. All your promises are a yes to us. I pray we draw near to you like Hebrews 4 says. 
but I pray we'd also draw near to our neighbors and love them in the way that you loved us. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Let it be true. I love you, church.